they're becoming a rather nasty party, have become a rather nasty party in lots of ways. It isn't most of them, but the tail is wagging the dog. There's a substantial minority whom I don't recognise as conservatives. They, they ought to have been in a UKIP or something like that. And um, I, I'm, I'm in despair about the Conservative Party. This is The Storytellers, where each episode we speak to esteemed journalists at The Times and The Sunday Times and ask them for three stories that have defined their career. And today it's a huge pleasure to welcome The Times columnist Matthew Paris. Hello. Hello. Thank you for subjecting yourself. I'm not esteemed at all. Well, <laughs> you are very modest. Um, and I'm sure that, that will come up in our conversation. Um, should we start with the piece that maimed you? You probably would have hated to kind of choose these pieces for us because because you're pretty modest, as we've said. But the piece that made you, Bedtime with the Bottom Liz. This is one of your early parliamentary sketches yes. for the Times, 1989. And the Bottom Liz are the married couple, Peter and Virginia Bottom Liz, both Conservative junior ministers working in different departments. Why is this the one that made you? Well, it was very early in my, my career. I, I started, I think, in the, at the end of 1988 as a sketch writer. And really, it was sketch writing that made me. If I hadn't been reasonably successful as a sketch writer, I'd never have gone anywhere else. Um, everything else in the Times, the columns, all that kind of thing, was built on the sketches. So it was important that early on, I wrote a few good parliamentary sketches. I actually knew the bottom list because I'd been in Parliament mm. uh, with them. You've been an incentive MP? I had, and he was a junior transport minister and she was a junior minister responsible for the national parks. And a number of questions came up where the national parks were sort of pitted against the Department for Transport or the other way round. And so for my sketch, I envisaged what it would be like in the bottom of his marital bed. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, as they discussed either the affairs of the day or the parliamentary agenda for the following day. And I think I wrote where is it? This read, as I said, yes, let us so far as possible without impropriety picture the bottom of his barit marital bed in a peaceful home at the end of a crunchy gravel drive in a leafy part of Surrey. The children are asleep. Peter and Virginia, too, have retired after an evening at work on their ministerial red boxes. She sipping orange juice, he an alcohol free Riesling. The silence now is broken only by the hoot of an owl and a night breeze whispering in the laburnum tree. But someone is awake. Darling? Yes, darling. Litter on the M18, darling. What about it, darling? It's piling up, darling, all over the central reservation. Mr Churchill's very worried about it. That was a junior MP. The, the grandson yes. Yeah. Set your mind at rest, Virginia. I'll get them. Every motorist who drops a crisp packet, every last one of them, I'll destroy them. I'll have them dragged in open ox carts down the hard shoulder and spat out by the travelling public. Just you see. Oh, Peter, thank heaven. As you well know, Virginia, I do not believe in the afterlife. Sorry, darling. And quiet returns to the scene, but not for long. Virginia, darling. Yes, darling. There's something I ought to tell you, Virginia. It's been bothering me. What is it, Peter? I want to say, well, it's hard to say, darling. Try, darling. I want to drive a six-line, I want to drive a six-lane motorway across one of your national parks. Oh, Peter, which one? Hush, readers, let us steal away before they hear. <laughs> um, MPs liked it very much because they all knew the bottom list. Readers didn't, but they learnt a little bit about them. Why and did it, the readers like it? It wasn't they didn't like it, but they wouldn't have been as familiar with the bottom list or the yes. fact that two ministers were married to each other. But yes. part of the purpose of my sketch writing was, I wouldn't say to educate readers, but to, to bring them into my world, the world the of best. Parliament, people that, that, that I knew. So I was, on the one hand, standing a little back from Parliament, laughing at members of Parliament, which readers always like, pricking their impertinence, their vanity, all the rest. And on the other hand, I was also inviting readers in to a world where I, I kind of knew what was going on. And I, I, that, that helped make the sketches work. And it worked very well in the end in that point. And inviting them into the bottom of this bed. Yes, yes. Um, by all accounts. Yeah. Um, so 
they were pals of yours. Yes, they, they yours. still are. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, so the friendship survived. Yes. Oh yes, no, they were delighted. Okay. Neither of them is averse to a little positive publicity. I think it would be. And that's probably fair to the say. case for most MPs, All of them. It? Which is yes. which, which makes your job as a parliamentary sketch writer pretty easy. Oh yes, yes. Because when people are a, a tiny bit self self advertising. It's very easy to, to, to laugh at them. Um, in the piece, you describe Mrs. Bottomley as something of the blue stocking, something of the glamorous air hostess and something of the hockey team. You say she's anything but a model of modest propriety. Impropriety. Uh, impropriety. Yeah, yeah well, I think, yes. Oh, I, anyway. Um, I think, so there are elements of this piece yeah. that are probably now a yeah. bit sexist. I was just reading that myself and yeah. thinking I couldn't write that. You couldn't now. write it now. You know, I imagined Mrs. Bottomley as in some of those uh, those films as the librarian, top half, you know, neat blouse, glasses, but uh, the camera pans down to the fish fishnet stockings. Um, uh, that that sort of semi pornographic library scene, which you absolutely couldn't use in a sketch these days. You really couldn't. And you couldn't talk about a woman in those terms. No, you couldn't. No, no. Um. For listeners and, and watchers, what's the difference between a sketch and a column? I mean, it's fairly obvious to us, but just for anyone who's... who's well, yes, bit. all sketches are columns, but not all columns are sketches. A column can be an opinion column. It could be a feature column. It could be an interview column. Sketch is actually a very antique item in, 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 in the newspaper world. It is a, a vignette, a picture of one small thing that happened, often done humorously. Charles Dickens used to write uh, sketches in the House of Commons, though they were mostly fairly straight-laced. My great predecessor, Bernard Levin, wrote sketches in The Spectator magazine. And it becomes a sort of institution, the sketch. And to be honest, it, it's actually, I would say, obsolete now, because the, the British public don't take a daily interest in the proceedings of Parliament. But if you can make the sketch good enough and funny enough, the fact that the readers don't actually know much about this, it'll still work. So I think that sketch writing survives now by the sheer quality of the sketches because it's really a slightly out of date idea. You said before, it's a truth about the sketch, uh, um, about sketch writers, that we can deliver ourselves all kinds of prejudice, but because it is in the garb of humour, it is accepted. Yes, up to a point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, let's move on to the piece that nearly broke you. Um, and this suggests, this is where you suggest piano wire across country lanes to deal with pesky cyclists. It's headlined, What's smug and deserves to be decapitated? Matthew, what did you do? <laughs> well, firstly, I didn't write the headline. Okay. <laughs> uh, we don't write our headlines. And on the whole, we don't even know, want to know what they are because then we are complicit in, in what they are. I had uh, been off walking up a few country lanes in Derbyshire and in the bushes were lots of high energy drink cans, empty high energy drink cans. And I was complaining about this to a friend and he said, oh, it's the ruddy cyclists, you know, they just, they drink their high energy drink and." toss the thing into the into the hedge. I don't actually think that's entirely true now. I had lots of representations from cyclists who said that cyclists don't do that, it's walkers who do that. Well, yes or no, I was angry and I wrote this rather intemperate sketch about cyclists and their angry little spittle-flecked faces and their, their sort of general dislike of the, the, the wider world. And um, I did suggest piano wire, but it was a joke. It was meant as a joke. And I, I now realise, and should have realised then, that there are some things that you can't use as jokes. And I was taken to the Press Complaints Commission. Goodness. And uh, they, th there were more complaints about that column than any, anything that they, any complaints that they ever had before about anything else. I think the entire cycling world, and some still spit at me when they see me, the entire cycling world had written to complain to the broadcasting, uh, to, to, to the Press Complaints Commission. Yeah. And I really, uh, well, what was even worse 
was the editor was James Harding, who's a very keen cyclist. And all hell broke loose. I, I assumed that I would be indicted by the Press Complaints Commission, but they deemed that cyclists are not an ethnic minority and do not have special characteristics <laughs> that need to be protected. Therefore, they could not uphold the complaint, but my name was mud in the cycling world. Goodness me. Um, can you remember some of what you said? Should we dredge it up again? Yes, do. Yes, okay. go ahead. In just one little posse of these monsters, there are levels of self-satisfaction that oh my power goodness. a small religious crusade. Does cycling turn you into an insolent jerk, or are insolent jerks drawn disproportionately to cycling? Well, there's something in that. There's <laughs> something I, in that. So I'm reading it, and I, I mean, obviously I know that yeah. you're a humorous writer, yeah. and I take it in that spirit. Yeah. And I wonder if you were the subject of sort of a 2007-style pylon that people who yes. don't know you, who don't read the Times, yes. just took it as read. I was, and I can understand it, actually, to be quite honest. I, I, I shouldn't have written what I did, and the response was entirely predictable you, and understandable. Are you just saying that now because you were told off for it, or do you no, really believe it? No, no, I mean, if I had my time again, I would not write uh, that column. But some of what I said about cyclists has some truth. I love cycling. I've always been a very keen cyclist, but cyclists as a herd, as a genus, so to speak, why, why do you never see them smiling? Uh, you, they, 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 their, their faces are sort of furrowed very serious. and angry. And when I was a boy, you just cycled in whatever clothes you were wearing. Now they dress up like poisonous insects in, in kind of bright coloured micro with their, their whippet thin legs. And as I say, their, their angry, spittle flecked <laughs> faces. They don't seem to be enjoying life. You don't see cyclists laughing and, and smiling. Uh, so uh, I do have a little bit of a personal prejudice against genus cyclistus or whatever, but not, not, not a, they're, they're a very lovable cyclist whom I know, but once they're on their bikes with their mates, they're not so lovable. And that's interesting. Mm. That's an interesting dynamic. It's yes. you know, perhaps if I'm to make a lazy comparison, like groups of men who go to football matches. Yes, yes. Um, or, or dogs who harry sheep if they're in large countries. Yes, yes. Um, so, in terms of what type of people were complaining, largely cyclists. Entirely any, cyclists. Any well-known people who also sort of... Well, a, your, a few friends who cycle said, oh, I thought that was a bit off. Um, but I, I think every cyclist in Britain, virtually, every cycling club must have written complaints in. <laughs> was it posted on all their Facebook pages? We laugh pages about it now, but <laughs> actually, at the time, I did feel awful because I knew that I had made a mistake. Okay. Um, did it have editorial sign-off? I mean, was it went through stages of approval, did it? How did it, how yes. Does it work? Yes, right. um, and, and you may say that my commissioning editor on the comment desk might have spotted it um, rather than put the decapitation into the headline. <laughs> but uh, who knows? I can't even remember who the, the editor was then. And anyway, I don't think it... I don't think journalists should complain that nobody has blocked something awful that they've written that they, perhaps they just shouldn't have written it. We're thinking of Jeremy Clarkson here, aren't we? Possibly. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, is that the only piece? So if you if you look at the piece online now, it's from 2007, and if you look at the piece online now, it has an apology at the beginning and, a, and an apology again at the oh, same does it? one. Yes. At the end, yes. It's, yes. It's, it's very clear yeah. that you've had your wings clipped on it. Yes, yeah. Um, and I wonder if it's the only piece that you've had to apologise for. Well... If I may raise the subject of nipples, <laughs> um, one of my parliamentary sketches noticed, you notice it particularly with women MPs, but you actually do notice it with some male MPs as well, that if they're wearing a thin shirt or blouse, when they're on their feet at Prime Minister's questions, everybody is, they have the nation's attention. Mm. There's a distinct hardening, a tumescence of, of the nipples. And it's very distinct because the press gallery is a very long way up from the, the chamber. Um, but you can look down and, and, you know, they're like chapel hat pegs, uh, some of them. So I did write a little bit about this. And, and I, I stress not just about women, but about men too. Okay. And, and actually, there's another effect with men, which I think on a polite program, I shouldn't. <laughs> but that happens too. And um, I, I was pretty roundly uh, abused by lots of friends for writing that. 
and I decided before she censured me that I had better write to Madam Speaker Betty Boothroyd mm -hmm. and apologise. So I wrote her a, a, a very um, craven letter saying I should never have written it. And I think I had a nice reply from her. I'm not sure she was all that bothered, Betty, but uh, on behalf of female MPs particularly, I don't think the men would mind particularly. Let's talk about the piece that stayed with you. Um, this is your first piece for The Times. I think it just about is. In fact, I think it is. Yes. Okay. And it's headline, Stop Being Beastly to Tatchell. Let's start with the context. You'll, you'll be talking about Peter Tatchell here. Yes. Who we, who we now know, you know, largely as a human rights campaign. Yes. What was he up to, though, when you wrote this in 1983? Oh, it was gay rights, mostly. I mean, he, well, he still is yes. a campaigner on that issue as well. I think he tackled an African bishop. Rugby tackled him in a graveyard. <laughs> Some, some time ago and brought him to the ground. I admire uh, Peter Tatchell very much. I always have. But in those days, very few people had heard of him. He was a very, very thin, as he still is, painfully thin uh, young man, uh, an absolutely obsessive, and you have to be, a uh, campaigner. And he was the Labour candidate for uh, Bermondsey, I think the by-election was. It was the early 1980s, as I, I recall and uh, may have been a, a little bit later than that, but everybody piled in on him, uh, particularly for, for being gay. Uh, that was always just mentioned, as it were, as a, 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 just an aside. But, well, for instance, the Social Democrat candidate, I think, campaigned on which queen would you vote for, you know, the monarchy or, or this anti-monarchist queen, uh, uh, Peter Tatchell. And, so it was very heavily implied. And the Labour Party did not come to, to the, the defence of their poor candidate, who was really swinging in the wind mm. by this stage. And uh, the, the, the Conservative candidate joined in the abuse. And poor old Peter Thatcher, I just felt sorry for him. The, the, whole, the whole newspaper world just sort of piled in on him. So I just wrote a piece for the time saying, stop being beastly to Thatcher. And one of the themes of the piece is don't attack the individual. You need to look at uh, yes. Look at the movement behind it, or you need to look at um, look at the hard left. I suppose you were implying at those times. I suppose I was. Yes. So you were sort of, you know, trying to take the heat off him by yes. saying you need to look at the bigger picture. Yes, perhaps I was being a little bit pompous there because my entire life as a sketch writer has been making fun of individuals, but I just felt it had gone much too far. Mm. And then it become. I don't like. I don't like lynching. I don't like lynch mobs. And you do see lynch mobs in the press quite often. And uh, something in me uh, reacts very strongly against it, even if that the, the person being lynched, so to speak, is someone I wouldn't normally approve of. He didn't. He didn't win that by election, did he? He did. To me, no. No. Um, and I don't know how long he stuck around at politics for after that. Um, I don't think he ever stood again. No, but no, he's I don't think he did. he's done much better than he would have done as a backbench MP. He's, yeah. I mean, his, his achievements are huge. I really believe in people who stick their neck out, and any movement, uh, any reform movement, you be it for women's votes or for equal rights for gays, needs outrageous people, uh, uh, sort of outriders on the flanks who go too far. Needs women who throw themselves under the wheels of carriages. Uh, needs people like Peter Tatchell, who has often said and done things that I think quite ridiculous. But that, that allows those of us in the sort of moderate middle to say, well, of course, I'm not one of those campaigners. I wouldn't throw myself under the wheels of a, a carriage. I, you know, why don't you talk, ignore them, talk to the reasonable ones? It's hard cop, soft cop. Mm -hmm. You need the hard cops. And um, Peter has been a hard cop all his life. Yeah. I admire him for it. Yeah, he doesn't... Um he doesn't deny it or would want to be anything else, I'm sure. And that 1983 Bermondsey by-election um, was described, in fact, there was a documentary called Hating Peter Tatchell. Gosh, um, 1983. So I was a member of Parliament at the so, time. So, yes. That was quite brave. Yes. So yeah. you do, I mean, it signs off. The author is Conservative MP for Derbyshire West. Um, so one question to you then as a, as a sitting MP defending mm. someone from the other side who was clearly a big advocate for, for gay rights. Yes. Did you get any blowback from 
I don't remember, but I'm sure I did. But I, I represented and still live in a lovely part of the Peak District, and now called Derbyshire Dales, it was called West Derbyshire in those days. You would never ask questions about things like that or say anything, not to anyone's face. Anyway, so there were murmurings behind the scenes, but I never had any kind of unpleasantness from anybody. You yourself decided to come out as gay in a late night commons debate the year after this piece, yes, I think yes. you saw. But no one really picked up on this. No, I tried to come out, but nobody noticed. So I, I went back in again, so to speak. Yes, it was a debate on Northern Ireland, extending the uh, limited um, moves for, um, for legal equality for mm -hmm. homosexuals. I think you still had to be um, over 21, but extending that to Northern Ireland. And um, Enoch Powell was there as an Ulster Unionist MP, looking, I thought, extremely uncomfortable, uh, but speaking against it on the grounds that the Northern Irish people must decide these things for themselves. And I wrote the speech, uh, and I learned it by heart, and it didn't quite say I was gay, and uh, that was intentional. I didn't quite want a headline in the sun, so I just said that I, I had personal reasons to support the measure with, with all my heart, and, um, and left it at that. And that was it. That, I don't think anybody read the speech. Nobody heard anything about it. I had some nice letters from senior colleagues like Jim Pryor, who had obviously obviously recognised what I had been trying to do. Very nice letters, but the, the press, probably because I hadn't said I am gay, decided to leave it alone. Um, you came out again? If I'm, yes. If that's, if that's I had another go. Yeah. I mean, you must be one of the few people who's come out twice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you came out again in 1986, and that coincided with you leaving politics. Yes. Before we talk a little about politics, did you hear from Tatchell after that column? I've talked to him quite often yeah. since then. He didn't like write me a thank you note or anything like that. I wouldn't expect it from him, but um, he and I have great mutual respect, I think. So let's talk a little about current politics. And you gave up your membership of the Conservative Party after Brexit. That was something that you couldn't forgive them for. Yes, it wasn't, it wasn't Brexit. It was expelling people like Kenneth Clark and Dominic Grieve, good Conservatives, uh, Nicholas Soames. So those 21... It, it was the, the expulsion of those, and that was just the last straw. Right. Um, I think it's probably fair to say Brexit no longer dominates the conversation around the Conservative No, they've all reinvented themselves now as, yes, as pro-Rwanda. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. It is, it is all of a theme, of yes. course. But the parties have the opportunity to move on from the 24-hour-a-day Brexit conversations. Yes. What have they evolved into, do you think? Mm. They're, they're, they're becoming a rather nasty party, have become a rather nasty party in lots of ways. It isn't most of them, but the tail is wagging the dog. There's a substantial minority whom I don't recognise as Conservatives. They, they ought to have been in a UKIP or something like that, and um, I, I'm, I'm in despair about the Conservative Party. There are lots of opinions within it when I speak to MPs about what true conservatism is, and I'm sure that that's always been a point of great debate. But, you know, each of the different factions, if we're to call them that, describe themselves as true yeah. conservatives. Is that just a complete sort of mesh of ideas now? Have they, have they lost that core identity? Did they ever have it to begin with? I think a bit like who's a true believer, who's a true Christian, who's a true this or that, um, as there is no definition of what a true example of the genus is, uh, you, you all fall to arguing about which of you actually carries the Ark of the Covenant and, and which don't. And the Conservative Party, uh, you know, uh, Tories or ex-Tories like me, would talk about the Conservative Party as being broadly centrist, in tune with the, 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 the vast majority of the country, um, prepared to change its mind about things not too ideological, We'd say that was true conservatism. On the right, they'll say true conservatism is, is principles, the free market, liberty of the individual, um, no state intervention. The truth is that you can argue till the cows come home what true conservatism is. But what you do need is a sense, I think, on the part of everybody in the party, that they are all in the same team, uh, that they are all interested in government, that they don't want to lose the next election. 
And uh, they've lost that now. They're just running around like headless chickens. And for you and your writing, I mean, you never intended to become a journalist or a, a no. writer, a no. uh, commentator, really. And where does that go now? Where does your writing go now? Do you see yourself doing this until the very end? No, or, no, no, no. I shall be 75 um, in a few months' time. Um, after that, I think that the time comes to, to stop. Uh, I, I, I think I'm still on top of the game, and that's the time to stop. I saw what happened with Bernard Levin, who's a actually began to lose his mind, and people talking behind his back, oh, poor Bernard, he's lost it. He can't remember anything anymore. Did you realize the sub-editors had to virtually write his last piece? And I thought, I don't want anyone to talk about me like that, so I'm going to stop while I'm, I'm waiting. Are you satisfied? Yes, completely. No, I mean, nobody, nobody could have got as far as I have on so little talent. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like those cars, you know, that just, just need a, a thimble full of petrol and they'll go for 400 miles. I have a thimble full of talent. And I got so far on it, I still can't believe that's my luck. That's just my, not true. It that's is, just it is. true. My, my, my literary agent, Ed, Ed, the late Ed Victor, wonderful man, once said to me, and the, the, this is what literary agents ought to do, he said, God has given you a minor talent, Matthew. And uh, I think that's right. Now, Peter Ackroyd, I, the novelist, I was at university with him at Yale doing postgraduate degree. We were great friends. But Peter once said to me, um, oh, how are you doing? And I said, I don't, I just can't really find my way in life at the moment. I, what's wrong with me, Peter? And, and he thought for a bit and he said, no, I, I can't say. And I said, no, go on. No, no, it would be too cruel, too cruel, darling. He, he said, um, no, Pete, please, Peter, I could take it. Just tell me. No, I can't. Too cruel. Peter, what's wrong with me? No talent, darling. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we are back to the monastery, which feels like an appropriate point to finish this. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. My Thank pleasure. you very much. Thank you. Miss Matthew Paris. Thank you. Lovely. Oh, that was such good fun. Good. Thanks. Good fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 